Thank you very much, Alex. Um, yeah, I should say from the get-go, I am going to be sticking quite rigidly and quite timidly to my notes today, so do bear with me. Um, but hi, everyone. It's um, really great to be here today. A little bit distracting. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm Anthony Castagnetti, I'm a Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the Domestic Abuse Charity Safe Lives and today I'm going to be talking through our Men and Boys Voices project just to give you a bit of, of, of an overview as to where this project started and where we're hoping to take it over the coming year. Uh, so I'm just going to start off by giving a bit of an overview of Safe Lives if uh, you're not familiar with, with us already. Um, so as I say, we are a UK-wide domestic abuse charity um, we work with organisations across the UK to transform the response to domestic abuse uh, and of course a key part of that is listening to survivors, putting their authentic voice at the heart of our thinking. A big part of our strategy is looking at the whole picture and the whole family, so ensuring that each individual within the household is receiving the appropriate support that they need at the right time to make sure that families everywhere are safe and well. Uh, and crucially of course we challenge perpetrators to change, asking why doesn't uh, he stop rather than why doesn't she leave? Uh, and this, of course, applies to the gender um, of the victim or perpetrator, perpetrator and whatever the nature of the relationship. Um, I also just want to point out that um, last year alone, nearly 13,500 professionals received our training, over 70,000 adults at risk of serious harm or murder, and more than 85,000 children received support through dedicated multi, multi agency support designed by us and delivered with partners. Uh, and in the last four years, over 2,000 perpetrators of domestic abuse have been challenged and supported to change by interventions that we created with partners, and that's just the start. So, our work with men and boys began back in 2019, and this really came out of um, a, a desire, really, to address the distinct lack of engagement that we'd seen from men and boys in public conversations around gender-based violence, in particular domestic abuse. Uh, and we had a few initial research aims with this project. We wanted to explore male attitudes, behaviours, ex expectations, what views ultimately do men and boys have, how and where are they formed, uh, and ultimately what views do men and boys have about the relationships that they're in. We also wanted to explore any gaps in the service <laughs> provision available for men and boys. Uh, and crucially, and something that I'm really interested in, is um, really looking at or, or gaining a better understanding of those societal and gendered norms that ultimately underpin uh, a lot of male violence against women and girls. Uh, I, I should say this is the most tech savvy slide of the presentation, so don't worry, it's not all like this. Um, but as you'll see, uh, this work has developed or evolved uh, through different phases. Uh, so I'll just start off on the left hand side of the slide there. Um, uh, this work was the first part of the phase involved hearing the voices and perspectives of men and boys, which is of course crucial to this work. And to do that, we sent out a survey. Uh, and through that survey, we were able to reach over 1,000 men and boys aged between 11 and 74, asking them about a range of issues, including abuse, masculinity, and relationships. Um, and I'm just giving you an idea of some of the key findings from that initial survey. So you'll see there, over a quarter, or 28% of the men we spoke to, said that they had demonstrated behaviour uh, that they had regretted within a relationship. Of that 28%, only a tiny number feared that there'd be any real world consequences to their actions. Uh, and just a final point on that slide there, uh, sorry, on this half, um, over 84% of the men we spoke to either strongly agreed or agreed that society's view of masculinity can have a negative impact on the mental health of men and boys. Uh, moving on to the right hand side of the slide there for phase two. Um, so we really aim to build on those survey findings and really start to develop an approach that can provide that wraparound holistic response to address the needs of men and boys, rather than wait until they might reach a crisis point in their life, as is so often the case. Uh, and so to do that, we held an in-person two-day roundtable event, which was attended by a range of different organisations who work with men and boys. Um, I've given you an idea there of some of the key themes that were coming out of those conversations at that roundtable. Um, so that included uh, the absence of resources for working with men and boys around relationships. Uh, there was an, an acknowledgement from practitioners that there was a distinct lack of confidence uh, that they had in having these difficult conversations with young men. Uh, and of course, as I'm sure many of you will be familiar with already, the impact of cuts and services for men and boys was having a really detrimental uh, impact. 
Um, but there are also a lot of um, really other interesting bits um, of feedback from practitioners at that event, many of whom spoke about the need for positive role models for young men, whether that's at home, uh, in school, or amongst their peers. Um, and there was a need for young men to really have a better understanding of what constitutes abuse within a relationship, and ultimately where to draw the line between behaviour that is controlling or protecting. There was also an acknowledgement from the attendees at that round table that for a lot of the young men that they work with, there are a lot of pressures that come, in, that come with being a, a man or a boy uh, in society today. Uh, attendees reported that for a lot of the young men that they work with, not fulfilling those rigid gendered standards can have a huge psychological impact on them, um, which can impact the way that they conduct themselves and also their ability to form healthy relationships with others. Uh, and so with all of this in mind, um, we developed a resource pack alongside a podcast and a webinar session uh, that was aimed at practitioners to really enable them to begin to have those really constructive conversations with men and boys. Um, uh, I should also say as well, the, uh, the guidance is based almost exclusively on the points that came up uh, throughout that webinar, so, um, throughout that round table event. Uh, and you'll notice at the bottom of the slide there, we shape this guidance around five key things to remember. Um, so when you are working with men and boys, it's really crucial that you remember the language you're using. Is the language you're using relevant to them and the language that they use? And is, is the language you're using potentially a barrier to having those really in-depth conversations? Are you thinking about your approach? Are you going into that meeting um, aiming to build a relationship or build a rapport with that individual? Um, are you seeing the whole person? And that includes every aspect of their identity and their experiences. Uh, and as a final point, are you understanding the role and influence of their peers? And that's a both force for good and for bad. Uh, so that very quickly brings me on to phase three of the Men Boys Voices work, well, which is actually a standalone research project called The Verge of Harm. Uh, this work uh, has been working directly with young people who are beginning to display harmful behaviours in their early intimate relationships. Um, and that's really to better understand the root causes uh, of why young people begin to display these harmful behaviours, uh, and also to explore what support should look like for young people who harm. Thanks, please, thank you. Uh, so unfortunately I don't have too much time to go into detail about some of our findings, uh, but these quotations are from some of the young women we actually interviewed as part of this work, who really spoke very candidly and openly about their experiences of uh, dating young men. And I think for us, these quotations really demonstrate that the experiences of relationships for young people do very much fall along gendered lines. Um, so I'll just start at the top there, that first quotation. Um, I'll, I'll let you guys read it in your own time, but for us this quotation really spoke to how the motivations for entering into relationships are still very much gendered. The, the middle quotation there for us really speaks to the fact that the roles within young people's relationships are still very much gendered. And the final quotation there really speaks to the fact that young men and boys are still heavily influenced by various types of media, including pornography, uh, and that's really shaping their understanding of what is normal or acceptable within relationships. Uh, so that brings me on to phase four of the Men and Boys Voices work, which is the latest phase. Um, this phase, uh, at the moment, is looking at the potential for establishing a Men and Boys Voices coalition of individuals and organisations from a variety of sectors to really have that um, cross-sector discussion that we need about gender violence uh, and explore the role of men and boys themselves uh, from across the UK uh, and from, from across all walks of life uh, in helping to end domestic abuse. Crucially, while at the same time linking this to the whole host of pressures that we know that they do face. Uh, as part of this work, I've already had uh, a range of fascinating conversations um, with brilliant organisations working on the front line who are doing fantastic work in this area. Um, and I think it'd be really useful now if I just go into with you all briefly some of what those conversations covered. So, from our conversations, um, we found that there is, of course, no singular pathway into abusive behaviour. Um, but what I've tried to do here is very broadly summarise these different pathways 
through these five bullet points. Um, feel free to, to disagree with them. Um, this is purely from what we found from those conversations. Um, of course, they can be expanded upon, um, but I think they can be broadly summarized through these. Uh, there is, of course, so much that can be said about all of these, um, but I think for now it's sufficient to say that men and boys will go through all of these, albeit to varying degrees, throughout their life journey. Uh, and I think when you are working with young men and boys and, and are trying to address their needs, all of these should be considered as part of that same puzzle. Uh, just a bit more as well from, from those conversations we had with, with a range of, of individuals and organisations. Uh, we identified the following five themes uh, from those conversations, most of which uh, I'm sure will be familiar to all of you. Um, but again, I think it would be really useful if I just elaborate on these a little bit further. Um, so, starting from the top there, around the need to teach consent. It was clear from our conversations that we need to teach men and boys that ultimately consent does not happen within a vacuum, and that actually it's the result of power dynamics within any given relationship. Young people, particularly young men, need to understand that consent is not just about sex. Consent is around uh, building an atmosphere where people's thoughts and feelings uh, are brought to the table, and most importantly, they're heard. And I think in being open with men and boys about the nature of consent, we can really begin to better uh, challenge the gender roles and double standards that underpin a lot of male violence against women and girls. Moving on there to the prevalence of online harms, our conversations highlighted that uh, for a lot of men and boys, they are being groomed and sometimes radicalised into active misogyny in a lot of online spaces, uh, for example through insult movements or other far right and extremist groups. Uh, and I think a key part of this is really understanding what it is that's drawing men and boys to that type of content. Uh, and our role is ultimately developing better interventions to, to prevent this. We also spoke about the importance of tackling gender and social norms. So from our conversations it was clear that moving towards an approach that deconstructs um, masculine norms uh, and promotes gender equality should be at the heart of good practice. It's really crucial that we engage men and boys um, in conversations around masculine norms and the detriments impact this can have, not only on their lives, but of course the lives of others. Uh, moving on then to the role of education. We spoke about the need as well for, for greater learning about gender norms and inequalities, uh, both within the school curriculum and outside of it. Um, this means that anyone working with children and young people should receive appropriate training, and that training should really centre around the influence of gender norms and stereotyping uh, and the benefits, again, of challenging them for both boys and for girls. Uh, just a final point there about health and well-being. Um, it was very clear from our conversations, again, that a contributing factor to the poor mental health outcomes of men and boys is isolation and the disappearance of social networks. Uh, it was very clear from, from the people we spoke to that it's really vital that we support and create more um, well, supportive community spaces to help address this. Um, and men and boys should of course have the opportunity uh, and the space and the time to really explore the issues that matter to them, whether that's issues around gender, masculinity, sexuality, and of course mental health. So I think at this point it's really crucial that we at Safe Lives, uh, and all of us, begin to ask ourselves the question, well how can we look beyond these conversations and begin to identify some of the solutions uh, some solutions to some of the problems that have been outlined. I think as a first step, and I'm sure everyone in the room will agree, we've learned that men and boys need to be treated with compassion and empathy if we're ever going to get them to work alongside us. Um, there's a tendency to, when you are working with men and boys, or particularly statutory agencies and the criminal justice system, to, to label them as potential perpetrators of violence. I like to think of our role as being compassionate allies, um, who can really be the catalyst for positive change in young men. Uh, and this really comes down to equipping young men and boys with, with the skills and the tools necessary to really critically self-reflect on where those attitudes and behaviours do stem from. Uh, and this can only, this can only reap, they can only reap the rewards from this and you know, this can produce positive changes, not only in their own attitudes and beliefs, um, but of course also their ability to form healthy relationships with others. Uh, so as you can see from this slide, um, as part of the work we've been doing around developing a Men and Boys Voices Coalition, we've identified the following four themes uh, as potential areas of focus for this coalition. 
uh, and alongside expert organizations and potential coalition members, we're currently in the process of scoping out who is already doing fantastic work in any of these areas. How can we support and amplify the work that's already being done in this space? Um, and also, how can we refine these? And how can we um, use these to, ge to generate more fruitful conversations? Uh, how can we test their viability and see how these would actually work in practice? Um, so that's currently where we are with the Men and Boys Voices work. Um, so just going to the final slide there, just to say, Thank you very much for listening. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you all for turning up. I uh, really appreciate this. Um, of course, please do come up and say hello to me at any point throughout the day. I'd be really happy to talk to you more about this. Um, and if not, my uh, contact detail is down on the screen, so please do reach out to me if you'd like to know more, know more and or get involved. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm Megan, I'm from Speak. Um, normally I would be with Bryony, um, going solo today. Normally you get two for the price of one, but you're just getting me. Um, for anyone that doesn't know Sleep, we stand for Survivors Leading on Essential Education and Change. Um, and we started in 2019 on a beach in Mexico drinking tequila, which I really recommend. Best place to start a project. Um, we started as a mutual aid fund, which I can, if you come up to me at the end, I can tell you all about sleep. I've got a whole spiel, but I'm trying to focus specifically today around what we do around male violence. But we started as a mutual aid fund for survivors of sexual violence, gender-based violence, domestic abuse to apply for, to spend on whatever they want. The idea was we don't get to dictate how someone supports themselves in their recovery. But we can never just do one thing. Um, so we manifested and changed and ended up doing the work that we do now, which is what I want to focus on today, around male violence, but in particular dismantling some of the roots of male violence and exploring what that might look like and how that shows up in our everyday lives and shows up in our, all our communities. Um, so in 2021, which was a year ago, um, we started our emergency men's learning course. And we have wanted to start it for a really long time, maybe like two years before, but burnout, lack of resources, lack of money, um, just didn't allow us to actually uh, start this course. But then the Sarah Everett case broke and there was suddenly this kind of surgence of men in particular that were like, I want to do something. I want to I wanna take action. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to I wanna be a part of something. And we were like, okay, this is the time to launch our emergency men's learning course. And we called it an emergency men's learning course because it's an emergency. Male violence is an emergency. So we called it an emergency men's learning course. And the course itself is heavily rooted in non-academia. So I don't have a degree where I come from. The learning that I do always comes from, a, from an experience-based perception, perspective or perception. You know, I myself am a survivor of rape, of sexual violence, and of other forms of male violence. And through my work, both in the charity sector, which I left, and working in support services and women's services, which informs a lot of the work we do, but really this course is based on real life experiences. It's of the people we've met on our journeys throughout the years of the conversations that we've had with men, that we've had with women, that we've had with people who are either perpetrators or victims or survivors or just people that live every day in the structures in which we do. So the course was, or is even, a four week course um, and it's rooted in the idea of compassion, first and foremost. So no one learns if you stand at the front and say, this is what you're doing wrong and this is what you need to do. It doesn't work like that. It's about building a community where we as survivors, which we hadn't seen any survivor-led organisations doing work specifically around targeting the roots of male violence and creating spaces for men, cis men, to come together to really explore and unpack how does this show up in my day-to-day -day life? What is patriarchy to me as an individual? How does it manifest itself in my communities, on my streets, in my homes? What is it? So we started this course, and it was the most amazing thing I think I've ever done because I didn't know how much I was going to get from it. Um, being in a space, an online space, which I hate, but it was still being a part of a community that we had no idea needed to exist until it did. Um, um, while the course is rooted in compassion, it's also about exploring some of the really fundamental things that we need to explore, like accountability, um, rigid stereotypes of gender, consent, sexuality, kink, porn, 
all of these really important subjects that we're often being framed or still viewed in a lens that isn't necessarily individual or isn't coming at it from a different perspective. And one of the first things we do in session one is we ask a question. It's the first question we ask, and it's a free writing exercise. So the idea is pen to paper, you just write whatever's in your mind, whatever comes. Can, I've done it before, I just write, ah, I don't even know what I'm thinking. Um, and we write, ask this question, what does it feel like to be a man? So what does it feel like to be a man? You've got two minutes, just go. And then we ask people to reflect and, and give their feedback. And, you know, we get a lot of people, there's such a myriad of different responses. So it could be shame, guilt, dominance, power, uh, softness, joy, laughter. But a lot of the answers are, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it feels like to be a man. And that is wild. Because if you ask me what it feels like to be a woman, I can list you, I can give you a dissertation. You know, I can write a th like a thesis on it, I can write a book for you. But we have a population of men that do not know what it feels like to be a man. But there's a disconnect there between how they walk around every day not knowing who they are. And when you don't know who you are, or you're not connected to who you are, you don't know your history, you don't know where you're going, you don't know what you represent, you don't know what you stand for, it's really hard to understand other people. And that's where that disconnect can happen. And so we then sort of move that into how we can apply that, that lack of awareness or that lack of connection, to also then our understanding of things within the male violence context, so looking at perpetrator and victim. So we do a lot of work in the course around dismantling and unpacking and interrogating these notions of what a perpetrator is and what a victim is, what a survivor is and what a rapist is. And we've got this real binary view of it. So we have an idea that a rapist or someone that commits violence is uh, over there in the bushes, uh, you know, brute, big. That these are the language that we use. Often there's a real colonial aspect to it as well. So the concept of race as well as an intersection with how we often view perpetrators of violence. And then we have over here the victim, and she's petite, she's femme, she's cis, she's white, she's maybe middle class, and she's just going around her business and then she's attacked out of the bushes. That's the narrative that we have, and it's still played out every single day in our media. It's what we perpetuate. And so we're trying to break that down, we're trying to unpack well, what is it to be a perpetrator and what is it to be a victim and we start to see the narratives that are so toxic and so ingrained in our everyday life but also how the wider structural pressures in which we live in are having a massive impact on the way in which we are now actually viewing who can cause harm and who can be harmed and when we get that binary view if we think only that person can be harmed and only that person can be harmful it dispels, it, not dispels, that's really not what it does in any way, but it impacts on A, survivors being believed, but B, how we take accountability. So the, one of the things we talk about in men's courses is we go, okay, let's be really honest, you're going to harm someone in your life. And that harm might be what we might, and as a society, perceive to be very low level, which again, we need to really move away from this hierarchy of what harm looks like. No one, gets to just, no one gets to determine what harm severity looks like. So if someone touching your thigh and someone raping you can have the same impact. We don't get to determine what that looks like for an individual. We need to come at it from this dismantling of that structure because it ultimately is holding us back with actually being able to see one another and hear one another and actually lean into people's experiences when they're telling you that, which is always a privilege. So we explore what does a perpetrator of harm look like? What does a victim look like? We break down some of those binaries. But where we come at it is the reality that you are going to harm someone in your life. We are all capable of harming someone. And we all are capable of being harmed. We've all done it. It's about the process of accountability in which we take to understand where that harm has come from, why that harm isn't okay, and what we're gonna do to make sure that, that level of harm, or that way in which we've harmed, or the act of harm, we don't manifest again in ourselves, and we don't act that behavior out in the future. That's really difficult when you live in the world that we do right now. We live in a society, not just in the West, but globally, where getting something wrong is the worst thing you can possibly do. 
Making a mistake is the worst thing you can possibly do, and you will be punished for it. We have it as a prison system, we have it as a criminal justice system. We say, you've done something wrong, you go through that system and you stay there, because you are now not a part of our society. That is the issue that we are now seeing. That is why male violence is not ending, because we have a criminal justice system and a prison system that is causing more harm and pain to those that are actually perpetrating harm and pain. Because we don't ever come at it from the idea, well, why does someone harm in the first place? Usually, their basic needs aren't being met, or they haven't been given the foundation from the very beginning to understand what is right and wrong, even in that binary sense. So we need to start coming at it from that perspective, and that's what we do in our men's learning course. So it doesn't actually sound anything like what you'd think the course would be about. Um, but so much of what we're trying to unpack is this idea that if we can acknowledge that we are capable of harming one another, then we can acknowledge that we also need to take accountability and what that accountability looks like. And because we live in a world, like I said, where getting something wrong is the worst thing you can do, that's also coincided with the rise of council culture. So when we put that question out to the participants in our emergency men's learning course, the response of what we would do if we, if your friend, so we give a, a scenario for example, which is, you know, you're at a party and your friend, who's a female, uh, is tells you that they're assaulted by a really close male friend of yours. Okay, what would you do in that situation? And often the response is. Um, well, I, I, I cut them off, you know, I wouldn't speak to them again. I, I would want to separate myself from that person. And what you're doing in that sense is, A, you're disallowing that person to ever grow and change. You're not bringing them in in a supportive, nurturing environment which says, I care for you as a person, as a man. I care for you. You've hurt someone that I care for. You've hurt me. And I want to sit with you in this process of you understanding that your behaviour is not okay and that it's causing pain and that I want to be with you through this journey for you coming out the other side of that so you aren't ostracised by our group or the social circle or your workplace. You can come through that and I will be with you in that journey. But because we're not raising and allowing men to be vulnerable, we're not allowing men to be emotional, we're not allowing men to touch one another and be affectionate towards each other, those conversations, those discussions around how we can get people through a process of accountability of taking ownership of our actions and of our harm that we can cause, it's not happening. And so we need to look at the wider structures and the wider systems that aren't allowing for that to happen. That allowing for men to be asked the question, what does it feel like to be a man? And they go, I don't know. I don't know what that feels like. I don't know what that is for me. And so what we're trying to do in the work at Sleek and the work that we're doing in this men's learning course is trying to explore what alternative forms of justice would look like, what accountability would look like, how does it show up in our everyday, what does it look like in ourselves, and a lot of that is around really exploring the idea that we must come at it from a compassionate, empathetic place first, and we can only do that if we have compassion and empathy towards ourselves first. So we need to look at the things that are allowing men not to feel compassionate and empathetic to themselves. The fact that there aren't enough spaces for men to really talk about that and to explore why that is and where that's coming from and why that's being denied. And apply that then to how we take ways of looking at dismantling roots of male violence. I'm going on loads of different tangents and trying to bring it back to all these different things. Um, but I think for us, one of the key things and this is maybe what I'll wrap up with, but one of the key things that we explore in the men's learning co course, but also just generally in my day-to-day -day life, is language. Because I think we don't give enough weight to the power of language. And we have a really binary way of seeing language. So we think of discipline, and we think of uh, schools, or we think of the police force, or we think of um, your parents. We have a really fixed way of seeing certain uh, words, for example. And we apply that the same way as we do with the word perpetrator, or the word rapist, the word victim, the word survivor. We have a binary view of seeing those things. So if someone tells you that person's a rapist, you instantly register them as nothing more than a rapist. That becomes their entire identity. And what happens when you make someone their entire identity a crime or a criminal act, it means they can never come back from that. 
Because we as a society have said, you as a rapist, as a criminal, as a perpetrator of male violence, you stay over there. And we will all be over here. And we're constantly going to stay in those separate groups unless we start thinking, really interrogate the language in which we use. So rather than use the word rapist or use the word criminal, we could say that's a person that's caused harm. Yes, it's more long-winded to say, but what we mean when we say a person that's caused harm is we mean any one of us. And that that harm might look like it's at a different level, where it might look like it's more severe, and there are ways in which that obviously has to be uh, taken account of, uh, taken, what's the word, like, to account for. Um, but when we say a person has caused harm, you can come back from that. So, okay, you've hurt this person, you've harmed this person, but you're not a criminal. So you can come back from that. And it's really about viewing the language and the lens in which we view language and how much that impacts in our day-to-day -day understanding of things like perpetrators in things like male violence, the idea of victims. So language for us is really essential in trying to dismantle a lot of the roots of male violence and look at how accountability and ownership and responsibility are a community response, it's a collective responsibility, it's an individual responsibility, and it's something that we really need to centre at the work in which we're doing. I think I'm going to end it there. Um, we're going to talk about ambitions, which is really quite a recent project, which is what we've, we've done the last two years. Um, <coughs> but I've been around forever, unfortunately, in Bristol. Um, and it's coming out of what was Bernardo's base, and now it's Bernardo's old market services. So we run, and we've run services since 95 on child sexual exploitation. And with this being like a masculinity, masculinity theme, the whole idea of base was based on me working with young men who were selling sex in the late 80s. And the whole idea was for it to be a young man's project. But within six months, it was 95% young women's referrals. And that's totally appropriate, because that was the need. But in a way, we lost young men straight away. So in a way, and we peaked at about 15%, 10, 15 years later, for young men. And it's a huge issue about how we miss young men's needs and how young men don't get identified, don't get referred, don't talk. Um, don't give evidence um, and live with it um, and it's something we're really conscious of but in recent years that project has moved so we've got we get all the mispers of young people out of care so we can do follow up interviews so we can look at those windows of opportunity and the last three years we've had the Roots project and it's had the opportunity to work with the Roots team based in our project where we're looking at more criminal exp child criminal exploitation and how we bring that together and ambitions, the Ambitions Initiative, very much came out of an awareness of the differences between CSE and CCE and the approaches which might work. Um, and so that's, that's sort of where I'm with sort of two years in, and we want to look at that. And it's not a t-shirt project. Even though there's loads of t-shirts, it's actually so much more. It's a vehicle. It's a vehicle for engagement, contact, facilitating. And what we call it... Um, we call it opportunities through creative enterprise. So that really means when a young person comes in, is brought in, and, and, that's, and that's transferring people and, and young people who've been involved by CSE, but it's 80 90% young men linked to quite serious violence um, and criminal exploitation. That's the core of the work at the moment. And traditionally, quite a hard, hard group to reach and a hard group to, to maintain. Um, but I want to flick back a bit, a little bit before that, put a bit of context, because I've done boys' work for 40 years, and you get infected by this sort of narrative. I mean, the phrases I hate are things like toxic masculinity, because it don't help, and the way masculinity has become this deficit model. <laughs> and for years, you end up sort of like, it sort of sucks you in, and, and do you know that joke about, um, what is it? When you ask somebody for directions, and they say to you, well, if I were you, I wouldn't start from this point. And ask you, but this is, this is where I am. And it felt for years, a lot of boys were like that. A young man gets referred to you and he's like, I'm not going to put you somewhere else. Or, I wish, I wish you wouldn't like this, uh, or I'm struggling with your attitude. And I didn't feel that anymore. And there were sort of two, I was quite shocked when I suddenly sort of 
in a way, realise probably how stuck I've been for a long time. Um, and the two sort of reasons, and one of them was about three years ago, I retired. I stopped in 2017 um, and went away, sort of thing. But I got a chance to come back and do this research called Boys 2. And what Boys 2 meant, it was meant we, I could contact a lot of my ex service users and interview them with two PhDs, and well, they weren't there, but with the backup of a good research project, two PhDs, a professor, but find your ex service users and do a qualitative interview and do a demographic and do um, psychometrics. But the big one, this, this qualitative interview, was actually asking them about the abuse that we'd worked with on you over the previous sort of 20, maybe, maybe, some were 45, some of them in the mid-30s. But that unique opportunity of working with somebody when they're 14 and then talking to them when they're 40. Um, or even bumping into, you know, I bump into a few of my ex-boys, but, but it's still quite rare. But that, that, it was, it, was, it was too good an opportunity to miss, so I, so I came back. And we did it for 18 months and then we did the stuff. But, but seeing young men, seeing adult men, where they are, um, what they're doing, where they're going, you know, have you got a job, have you got a family, what's your social group in life, you know, are you in prison, are you alive? Um, it's something we miss. And I'd always connect, there's this analogy of, um, I've always had where it based, when we finish with somebody, maybe the, the case, and we're rubbish at shutting cases, and we've got every excuse under the sun not to close the case, you know, so we've got a whole list of them, because um, we don't want to, in a way, we don't want to, it's artificial, 18 means nothing. Um, but that's just, you know, I, I had my roof repaired once, and the builder, Bruce, so said, have I done a good job? I said, well, I don't know, if it leaks in six months' time, you haven't. If it leaked in five years' time, you haven't. At the moment, it doesn't leak apparently, but it hasn't rained since you've repaired it. And at 18, we say to them, how good a job have we done? And what was really obvious when I met the ex, at my ex-young people was, what we really, really have to do is create healthy 30-year-olds. And that has to be on the agenda every day. Not getting always sucked into the chaos, the crisis, the stereotypes. It's like, that's fine, you have, that, that's in your face. But how are we looking down the road to tell what a healthy third drive? And the great thing is now, I work with really healthy 28 and 30 year old staff. And I'm surrounded by people who are really impressive, as, you know, have joined us, and I can see in a way, every day, what we try to look for, because we've got staff, we've got a really great diverse staff team, um, and a really good age range, and culturally diverse, but I can see what a really healthy 30 year old looks like, I hear them all the time, because they work with us. So, ambitions. Ambitions started, and simply, it was like, how can you get, no, yeah, how can you reach better? Um, how can you move into a zone where, What's the offer? What should be on offer for a 14-year-old young man, maybe, who's got a lot of influences with group association, a lot of pressure on them, maybe running class A's, maybe subject to violence, maybe inflicting violence. Why would they bother coming in? Um, and we've got a team that connect really well, but we wanted to step up. So the simple idea was, let's look at some brands, let's look at some, best, as Jason always used to say, let's use the poison to keep them well. And so let's look at what goes on. They've got tons of agency. They can run stuff. They, no, their phone's banging out all the time. There's lots going on. But how do we actually get alongside that and use that agency and use that kind of initiative? And in a way, and at the same time then creating this window of opportunity where we can create these sort of like transitional relationships. And I guess that's always what it's about. Where do we create a relationship where a lot of relationships are just very transactional. I'll do this and you do that. I'll do that and do this. But, but from real movement, it's that degree of transformational relationship where, and you see it with some of our young people, they come in and they want to be like some of our workers. We had one young man, he went from the cusp of prison to like 18 months later and he wanted to be in his own he wanted to be a youth worker. And going from the cusp of prison to performing in Shambhala last August on the stage. And it's like, you know, that, and, and he did that because he wanted the transformation of the worker. He, he wanted to be that worker. So I think, we, I think maybe through, through the work we do for so long, we tell people things, but actually that's pretty pointless. We have to walk the walk and we have to model the kinds of behaviours we actually want. And that's what's often missing in so many young men's lives, is they haven't had that 
that subliminal role model. It's always pointless telling a young person who desperately needs to carry a knife, don't carry. They know all the risks. They've seen their friends go down. They've been to that probably. How do we role model that? How do we role model? So one thing that young people do come to base, and we hear it a lot, is, thank God, they say, I actually feel safe here. I actually feel safe. So what we do now is we, we offer them we offer them stuff. So they come up with stuff um, on my face. We ask them, and they bring back their lives. This, I love this one. You know, he, he, gave, he, he gave trap, sleep, repeat. He, he could be hard work. He could be really hard work. But I love the fact it says trapped, no sleep, repeat. And what comes through so much of their stuff is the phone never stops. The pressure's there. What's that? Well, money never sleeps. Busy till I'm rich. Trapped, sleep, repeat. They're giving, us, they're giving us their words. But what we have to do is try and do it for real. So we sell them. We find every opportunity. And they'll get a percentage of the money. And, and it's tough. And often they won't turn up. Or they'll come, up, come in and come out. Um, but then what we did, we banged it on the... Um, we banged it... And please take these away. We banged it on the um, Bernardo's website. We got a big retail website nationally. So we got a QR code. And you can click on that. And then it goes straight to the T-shirt. So you can buy their T-shirts online. And then the email goes via London Menardos into our office and then they pack it off. Complete strangers buy it. But it's just like for years, Bernardos, biggest children's charity in the country. That took about a year to get Bernardos to take that on. It's pathetic. Um, because they're stuck. Even the best charity in the country is stuck. There's no radical thinking. We can, we can only give an 18-year-old vouchers when he's starving in yoga. Pathetic. So, we've tried to push the envelope. So we want brands. They give us such truth. Um, so, I mean, for me, it's opened up this energy. And I guess, Jack, do you want to show? We, every, 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 advert, every sort of brand, we try and do the advert so we can actually push it out on their Instagrams. And we didn't put a lot of the young people in their films because they'll get dissed and cause problems. But this young man really want to be in it, and he pushed for it, and it's on all the Instagrams, out as public. Um, Jack, do you want to talk about Zach, and then we'll go on to... Yeah, so hello bro, I'm Jack. Um, I work with the young people on the Ambitions Project, teaching them music, or working with them, to help them create music, and sort of, not sell them a dream, I think a lot of projects can sort of get them in, and then just get them out, push them back onto the street, and don't necessarily give them real life things. So a lot of the young people, like Paul said, we had a young person performing at Shambhala, we get young people's music on Spotify, Apple Music, stuff like that, help market it and push it out properly. Film them videos. This is filmed by um, a woman that volunteers for us and is really, really good at what she does and stuff like that. So it's about giving them real life experience in what they're trying to do, obviously, try and sort of encourage their ambition into this, so I'll show you this video. Familiar face in there. No sound. Technicals. While that's doing that, it's basically, I'll speak more about the ambition thing. Um, it's a lot of the young people that we work with, like with Bernardo's and stuff, they're referrals, but they don't have to come in to work with us, essentially. It's not your, it's not compulsory for them to actually get through the door. And a lot of young people then just say, oh, I can't bother, I don't want to, you know what I mean? We've all been 14, 15, 16, 17, the last thing that we want to do when we're, I guess, well, in lots of, in lots of cases, but especially if you're involved in a very fast paced life is take your time out of the day to come and work with a youth worker and be told what's right or wrong or whatever. We need to get them through the door. This gets them through the door if they come and work with us. We're offering them something that they want to do. Music, help them build t-shirts, help them create a legal business. That gets them through the door. Then that allows us to do our youth work and challenge certain opinions or perceptions that they may have. And and actually engage and have that conversation with, with each other. So, I guess that if it was playing before, if you, if you take those videos out, we'll be all right. The community, the cultures, the noise at night, to an outsider, the 
Some of us want to do DJing, some we just get involved in the marketing, others we use and come in because they want to have conversations. And it's, it's almost a good excuse. You know? it's, it's a resilience and it's a strength based model. We don't chase the problems in a way we're incredibly uninterested in the problem. <coughs> because in some ways, that almost gives them too much, but they're there. And we, like with one young man, he's there, he got thrown out of YM, CA in, in Somerset. And he had to stop his session and talk for 20 minutes about that because it wasn't fair. The other person didn't get thrown out. They both kicked off. Um, and we'll stop and we'll listen, but then we'll move on. Um, because actually, there's a disease case. And the same way Jason Watkin, we've, we've got this great turn up with, with young men. Jason, what do you think the challenges and, and the successes are for, for your young men coming in through the um, Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Morrison. I'm part of the Roots Project. Um, and you see about your challenges. Um, I think one thing we need to look on is the culture in Bristol, or maybe not the culture in Bristol, youth culture. What's youth culture? And I think as a youth worker, as a practitioner, we've got to be really aware about what are the pillars, what hold up youth culture. And uh, with the Ambition Project, we, Ambition have, we have viewed this, we have analysed what is youth culture. So we've got the music, the, um, the art, the, um, the videos, the games. And with all of those, those pillars, what's embedded is the violence. So we, you know, we're young people there, your culture is heavily involved with violence. So with, um, with the Ambition Project, Ambition Project, we identify the, what, what are the strands, what are the pillars of youth culture, and how can we use this to complement youth culture? So obviously you've seen the videos, you've seen the art, you've seen the, the music. We want to go down the road of making games, you know what I mean? So, but it's something what these young people, young guys recognise and what they belong to. So having a project, what they could belong to, this is where they feel, this is where they feel, this is what can relate to, this is stuff I can relate to. Now, if coming from my background, Bristol born, inner city, born in East, East and St Paul's, came from a semi-professional basketball, uh, basketball player, gang member, now worker. So that journey, and I totally understand a lot of these young guys' journeys, where they're coming from, where they started, and where they're going to go. And the justification of why they behave like that. Um, as you say, with that masculinity, I know you say you hate this word, toxic masculinity, <laughs> you know what I mean? But with the masculinity, the gang kind of, being involved with gang, it kind of it kind of complement that. It kind of gives them a purpose in society. It kind of gives them, um, how can I say, something exciting, exciting, because that lifestyle is very exciting. But on the other hand, these young guys go to school, they, as I say, young people being on the, on the path of being excluded from schools, from the community, from their faith group, from their team. Um, that toxic masculinity is something what provides for them. The gang, the street life, it provides for them. It gives them a purpose. It gives them something. They don't see themselves in society about finding a nine to five job, being successful. But, but on the street, it's very easy. I have a role, I have a responsibility, my friendship group, I'm very familiar to this. With the Ambition Project, having something like, having the, as I say, the activities that we're providing, it gives them a chance to sit down and reflect about their life and have those quality conversations 
why they're doing the art, why they're making the video, why, why they're designing the t-shirt. This is when we, this is when the expertise actually comes in to talk about what is going on for you, what's happening, what are your wants, what are your needs. And obviously their version of masculinity is a whole different, it's, as I said, it's toxic. Jason, remember so, that, huh? that when two young men went after me, two, two new cousins, and, the, and, and you're in with them and they asked me if I'd ever been arrested or been to prison. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I said, no. And, and they both looked at each other thinking, that's odd, you know. And um, been, in, been in prison, cell? No, no. And, uh, and then one said, why? How? You know, why? And I said, well, do you know what? I've got, loads of, I've got respect for some police officers. I've got less respect for other police officers. But I don't want to give them more power over me than they've already got. I so if I get stopped, I can go, well, actually, why am I being stopped? I'm not carrying knives. I'm not carrying class A's. Um, you can search me if you want. Our boys get stopped, and they, it goes up the roof, and they get nicked. Often, and, and they not be. And they looked at each other, didn't they? And yeah, then I so left what the room. Talking about? I yeah, left yeah, them with, yeah, with you too. So yeah, so those quality conversations, this is so important to have such a diverse team. And not just about that, it's the experience the team has, the knowledge mm -hmm. base, mm -hmm. to have those quality conversations and give them ultimate al alternative about life, the choices that they have. So it's very important to have something like this, a carrot, to get them into the, into the OMS, to have, to sit down and really, they, they feel safe. As you said, they feel safe. They feel that um, even if my young person, they're not, if I, I'm not there, they know I, they could go to somebody else and talk to them. And I mean, so it's just like whole, um, it's so, like I say, it's, having that diverse team is so key part of this ambition project. I mean, I know male, female, <coughs> colour is, is something where these young people will all benefit from. And having a, as I say, creating a platform where they can actually feel safe. As I said, OMS place is a place where they really feel safe. They really feel that they can say something and it will stay, it stay, within, it stay within the walls of the, the building. And 65% so, were black young men coming into the project, which we've always struggled with. We've talked, reaching black young men with CSE, we're reaching young men with CSE has been hard enough. Mm. But having that, like, as you say, that's a dream team we've got. That's it's massive, like, yeah. That's luck, that's it's massive. Tremendous especially team. working with young guys, especially young black boys within the inner city area, where they don't see they're being exploited. And this is something what I've seen, and this is something I can really understand. There's a thin line between someone, a friendship, and being exploited. You know what I mean? Because a lot of the exploitation is happening for your family. My cousin exploited me, my big brother exploited me, because they was exploited. And that is something that was normalised. But when you actually sit down conversation, have a conversation with these young guys about the whole thing about being exploited or about vulnerability, they will look at me like, you want me to confine to society, you want me to work in a barber shop, where the barber shop, barber is earning 500 pounds, but he's only giving me 50 pounds on that. Who's being exploited? I mean, you want me to work a nine to five where they're going to exploit me. Why did I do, why did I do something properly on the road when I'm in control, when I'm my own boss? Why am I going to another boss? And I totally understand that, where they're coming from. But then it's that, common, as I said, those quality conversations about the long-term effect. Because we are, with these young guys, a lot of these young boys, everything's short-term. Everything, what I'm going to gain now. If I do this, that's what I gain now. If I put stuff on the media, this is what I gain now. It's having that conversation and revealing about what is the long-term effect on your life, your, your livelihood, your mental, because everything when we talk about these young people, it's about the psyche. How they, where, they, where do they place themselves in society? Do they place themselves in society? Do they see themselves achieving at all? But they see themselves doing great in the gangs. They see themselves doing great on the, on the street. So not every young person who's a blonde on the street is a gang member. I mean, and this is something we've got, to we've got to remember. But as I say, they find their place in their, within the, like I say, the criminal justice system. They find themselves in the criminality. Until we have those quality conversations about the impact of their life, the long term, not the short term, the long term, this is where we're going to have a real major impact on these young guys. And this is me, my major problem. I have. They say these young people are hard to reach. They're not hard to reach for us, not at all, but they are to have an impact on. And then we got, what's the difference between reach and impact? You know what I mean? And this is something we're not, I think we're kind of failing. We're not having a major impact on our young people. We're reaching them. Easy, I got a flyer right here. You want to go to a party next week? Yeah, I'm coming. I was reaching them. But I've been doing something having a major effect on them. And I think ambition, we are going, going that way. We're following those rules of understanding like, where this young person coming from? And having that walk, where you are, let's come, let's walk together. Let's get to a destination where you feel safe. Let's get to a place where you know that you're doing right. Not justify that, try to justify what you're doing wrong. Not giving it every excuse. Oh, the reason why I'm doing this because A, B, and C. You know you're doing wrong. Stop chatting shit. You know what I mean? 
let's do this, let's, let's start, start in that destination of doing something right. And what's really nice is you see staff completely respect them, so particularly those young men, and that's all we want back. And we have had very little violence in that, in that building, if any. I but think. I think, I can tell you, we've got to compliment the staff though, because our staff, because of the knowledge base of the staff, we all know what conflict's going on. We understand the gangs. We understand what issues is going on. So we know if um, Lily is from the front, she worked with a young person, we're going to be totally aware that her young person and my young person can't be in the same place. I mean, because of the, obviously, it's just safeguarding a young person, but I'm going to be selfish. i got to safeguard myself. You know, understand that? So it's about how do we safeguard young person and ourselves at the same time? The knowledge base is so quality within our team to understand what is actually going on. What is the current issue? How do those current issues affect our young people? And how can we, the major, major thing, how can we keep them safe? And that is coming from the conversations we're having when the t-shirts are building, when they're designing the actual t-shirt. And that's what I've got to say, bro. Could we put on sashes? Yeah. I, I just don't think quite nice to be like, oh, these videos have me in there. So. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Jack's only into it. The video of uh, mine. <laughs> and, uh, that's right. Um, but, the, the, I mean, this young man, um, this young man spoke, to, he's, he's, he, he's met all the senior managers and the local authority, the training and the skills, he, he met with loads of police in Somerset, not the ones who arrested him luckily, but um, t you know, talking about that he's, he's met with senior managers in the um, uh, health, and, and what is he now, 18? Is he hit 19? Um, 19, yeah. And, you know, he said to you the other week, he said about, you know, what age you work up to is, well, we, we, we might take someone at 24. And he's going, well, because I can be here for another eight, six, seven years. So that's, that's not the idea. But he wants to be a youth worker, so we can get him some placements. But, you know, he, he, he has, and now his music's on this, we're waiting for him to come back. There's a big national training film being made. And they've paid him 200 quid for his music to be on the backtrack for this film. And it's real money, and it's real esteem. Um, and so much, you talk about trying to promote self-esteem, you've got to do it through real things. You know, it's not a little form going, oh, I'm good at this, I'm good at that. It's almost got, it's got a walk and walk. Um, so the, this is the, f the first one we ever made. Um, and, he, and, he's, and he'll ring up every week saying, you know, what my sales like this week? Well, you've only sold one. Well, that's fine, that's 15 quid. You know, that's, I can eat this weekend. So, Jack, will you, will you come up? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to play it now. So this, he's got his t-shirt brand, Royal Diamonds, and he's also, this is the same person who performed at Shambhala Festival, and now he's sort of, he's really round with the whole project. Uh, this is his song as well. The vocals are sung by another project worker that worked with an artist. And then he's in at the end. And that's obviously me. <laughs> 